what we're looking at is basically a version of the drawing that's the representational component for the project. So this is that that three axis of uh, axonometric sections. These sections are tilted to the left side at 60. So on the corner we're looking at 60 on the right hand side degrees and 30 on the left hand side. Um, we're going to use the similar method that we talked about last time on how to produce them, which is going to be by slicing them up and then doing the kind of projection um, that gives us the, the, the actual angles of a drawing like this, and then placing them in the template. You, it's very kind of a simple drawing. You can see that it's basically just a matter of line weights and um, a matter of the transparency for the transversal section. We're going to just kind of keep it the one color to be simple about it, but it's a relatively straightforward. I think once you've gone through the kind of work to digitally make an accurate model, this, this part will be a little bit easier on you if you kind of just follow through on the steps, and I think a lot of the stuff we talked about in 201. When it comes to layer management and doing everything um, in terms of line weight by dealing with layers instead of individual objects is going to save you um, a ton of time. Um, and some of those kind of tricks will come back too. So I made a very quick, poorly designed, but kind of apt model of um, what we're doing to use in the, this is what we're calling, and it's a kind of arbitrary assignment, the Y direction. Um, this is along the nine inch longest axis of the drawing. I've kind of filled in my model um, on that. So you can see that we've got four sections. Uh, the section cuts are clearly visible in black. Um, we've got both visible darker lines and lighter lines. These are this, the complex geometry you guys can probably imagine if you did an x-ray of your model right now. It's really complex. There's a lot going on in it. Um, these are bigger drawings. These are one-to-one -one drawings. So we're trying to take advantage of both the section cut and the fact that they are um, complicated to spread out the space and try to make it as clear as we can in a two-dimensional projection. A lot of that weight's going to be on you and where you pick the sections, for sure, because you can't really, the geometry is the geometry, and you definitely can't design it for one of these drawings. You're designing it as a model, right? So it is, it is what it is. It's, it's really about making the clean drawing and also just making the section cuts at spots that you think are kind of complementary to each other. That's, that's the big kind of imperative there. You get to choose the orientation, meaning this thing's sitting like this. It didn't have to sit this way. I could have flipped this thing 180 degrees around the, around the axis. It's, it's, it, that is totally under your purview, so that's up to you. Uh, what I'm going to do, I've got these kind of box placeholders here because it would be the same project in the top and the bottom. What I'm going to do and just for time is do the one with the, the what we're calling the z-axis here, which is the, the smaller amount of cuts. Basically, one cutting off the face and then one through the center of what's left over. This is standing up on the edge, so it's only going through about four inches of material. There's not a lot of real estate that's going on there. So I'm just going to kind of do a full run through here, and um, I haven't done this part yet, so this is basically um, where you guys would be when you're starting it. So each one of these drawings has its own template to kind of keep things manageable. There's three Rhino files, one for the X, one for the Y, one for the Z, and each one of them already have the right amount of sections built into them, so you don't really have to. It's almost foolproof in the sense that you don't have to, you're going to know how many sections you need because that's how many sections are going to be there. The layout of the drawing, um, and I'll kind of clear this out, is I've got a placeholder here. I made this model just for the drawing, so I'm going to delete that. But what you're going to have is just a placeholder that you can bring your model into, and that's going to just be on its own layer. That will just remind you of the orientation that you want. It's important for the sections, because the sections are in specific spots, so you don't want to just um, bring the model in at any space that you want. We want it in that space. So I want to go back. I've got, I was working on my model um, over here in the Y model. Um, I'm going to select it. That's my Y model. It's the original one right here that I've been working on. And that's what I've used in my previous drawing. I'm going to copy that into my clipboard and just place it in the other 
uh, model. Just paste it in there. So the orientation's off. Um, I'm just going to use the gumball to rotate it 90 degrees. And I'm going to move it to the zero point. So I'm just going to grab my front left corner here and type in zero to my move destination. So this is basically in the right spot. It should, the way that this template's built out, if I turn off my placeholder, um, those clipping planes should cover it. It doesn't matter that they cover it. It's more just a visual key. Clipping planes are infinite, meaning these clipping planes could be any size. They're still going to slice to this model. Um, and they're already kind of set up for the views that I've got. So this. Up top, every every template set up this way, your top viewports are your kind of ones you're used to, top right perspective that we've got. The other ones is going to be whatever sections are coming out. So in this case, we've got the Z face, the front, the first section, and then the back section that comes out. And those are those are already linked up to the viewport. So if I just do a quick zoom extends for all these viewports, you can kind of see what's going on in this model. So one thing I do need to do is I need to put on my um, transversal surfaces for the model to kind of show how I'm getting through it. I'm just going to do it really basic on this one because it's more about the process than the actual surfaces themselves. So I'm just going to really basically just use this surface down here as a way to get through so you can see the process happen uh, quick enough. I'm just going to turn it on that layer and I'm going to extract that surface which is under uh, solid surface extract. Uh, I'm going to make my output layer the current layer and I'm going to make a copy of it because I don't want to pop it off of my existing model and it's that one right there and now I've got my model I've got my transversal surface remember you probably won't see it just because the, the where your graphics card depends to draw things the next thing I need to do is kind of determine um, my section cuts. If it's at an eighth, the Z face sh should be in a good spot already. You shouldn't have to worry about it too much. Mine's looking pretty good. You want a, a little bit of this. If, can you guys see that little lip that's on there? Because you don't want to cut it directly on the face because then you'll have that part in your first section and it'll block up your section. You won't be able to see it. So you want to go a little past one eighth back. This is like just slightly back, enough that in a drawing, it's not going to make that kind of a difference, but it's going to clear that. You don't want some kind of uh, messy geometry up front. So my Z face is actually okay. So it really just becomes where do I want to place this section? And that can be tricky. You, you're going to want to play around with it. The good thing is you can use any viewport to move it. So I'm basically just moving this one right here. I can, I can use any viewport. Um, it's going to be visible. Um, and the Z1 and the Z2. I can use the top. I'm just going to hold down Alt and take off my snaps for a second. And I'm kind of just watching my Z2. And that's actually not too bad. What I really want is if you look at my Z2 viewport, you want to watch out for stuff like that where there's a wall right in the front of your section. It's going to block off a lot of views unnecessarily. So if I go back into it a little bit more, I'll do something like that. So the view, the viewports are in the right spot. I always play it safe and just make a copy of things from my drawing. So those are there, and I'm just going to make a copy of it with the gumball. I'm just going to move it over, tap the Alt key. And then I'm going to draw my splitting surfaces on here. I've got some old ones so when I was doing that little box demo. And I'll just make some new ones now. Really easy. I can use the surface from four points and just snap to the ends. And then just copy that one.
So at that point I can turn off my clipping planes and look at what I need to get this thing going. Now because I was just looking at my views and not really looking at the geometry, um, I could be okay, I could not be. Chances are you're going to have some kind of difficulty when it comes to the splitting, and I'd say difficulty lightly. It's basically, it's just not going to come out 100% perfect. And it's more the nature of what we're doing. Typically, we could just use clipping planes, and we could just print, do make 2D on the clipping planes. But we have actually need to have the geometry in the right perspective, or in this case, the projection is the axonometric. That causes us to warp the geometry. We'd have to warp the clipping of planes along with it. And what happens is you've got clipping planes in the top view when we go to make the 2D that are sitting like this. And they're clipping each other out. And, they, and, you, and the, you visually can't get both. So that's the reason why we have to make the extra step and split it up. Otherwise, we would just have a bunch of clipping planes and then just do make 2Ds for every viewport and we wouldn't have to split the geometry up. But because we're kind of cheating on getting the projection, this is the price we pay. When you're doing a lot of kind of complex geometry digitally, it almost never comes out perfect the first time uh, in terms of like 100%. Usually you're going to have to do a little bit of doctoring. The, the main issue for us is we're, we were using very dumb geometry in the sense that it's not embedded with a lot of information. These are flat planes usually. The surface I put through them, tremendously simple. They've only got four control points on them. They're very limited on information. So when you try to split something that has holes in it, like a surface like this might be problematic. That's out on the right. I've got to ungroup it. Like I see a guy like that, I'm worried about it because it, I'm not splitting through all the holes, but there's holes in it and those are just trim information that's in there. It might give me some kind of error. In that case, I'm just going to be on the fly. I'll doctor it up when that kind of stuff happens. But it usually is going to have something small like that. Not a huge deal, but you, if you sit there and try and do it 50 times and hope the 51st is going to be perfect, it's kind of a waste of time. You're better off just doctoring it up kind of quickly like that. So I'm going to split it up. Um, go back into my top view. It's the easiest way to do it. And when I split it, I just want to make sure that I'm splitting the green stuff too. Um, my cutting objects are going to be those red planes and I'm going to split it up. Now I ungrouped it. If you've got stuffed up group that's grouped, that's fine. Um, but it might, it'll stay grouped. So you can split things that are grouped and you, it'll work. Like, and you won't realize it. So if I had like two boxes here, this is like a quick example. Because I know I used to think that the split was not working. And I just take a line and try to split something like that. So I'm going to group these two boxes and then I'm going to split it. It's telling me it's split into four pieces, but those four grease pieces are still grouped together. So I can't access them yet. I still have to ungroup them. I can keep splitting it as many times as I want. And you can see the split ran through there. I've got to ungroup it, and then I can get to the individual pieces. It's, some, it's a kind of common occurrence here. So on this one, so it looks like some of it split up, some of it didn't. If I take a look at it, let's see, see. if I move it off or bit it. Kind of quickly access the situation. So it looks like this big poly surface didn't split up. So I'm going to go back and rerun it and I'm going to explode this one out to just run the explode command. It's much easier to split single surfaces than it is to split poly surfaces. Well, 16 of them split up, so we've got more of them split up. We'll see how we went on it. Like there's a there's one surface that didn't split. Might be only one. And let's see this one. And there's our face. Face might be all right. Why not? So 
So we had a poly surface inside of a poly surface. So we'll explode it and then explode it again to make sure that everything is split up and then we run the split. Kind of a good sign if it's taking longer. All right. This is a, this is a kind of a kind of a typical thing that's going to happen. So it's, that's that's perfectly fine. So it looks like we've got this guy and this guy. That's good. Our, my front's off. This one maybe two maybe these two were a little bit problematic and it's kind of what I said it if you've got a hole like that it doesn't want to slip you guys can you see how there's like no black outline on here that's a that's your graphics card building a mesh it'll pop in and out and stuff like that it's 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 bugging out because you attempted to split it it's not quite working if I turn on wireframe, you're not going to see that thing, but it is kind of a, a red flag, meaning like this one didn't want to didn't want to split up the way that we wanted it to. So I'm going to just undo my moves and leave it split the way it is, and I'm just going to take that object itself. I'm going to and I'm just going to make a new surface instead. I'm just going to dupe the border of this object like that. You can see it's got some kind of graphics issues going on with it. Right. And I'm going to add two curves right there. And then I'm going to run our friend the curve boolean command. just to make two closed curves out of it. Maybe I'll make three closed curves out of it to kind of save myself some time. So let me add another one right here. And I'll take these planes off for a second. Actually, I'll hide these for a second. So you can see. So I want, if I do that, then I've got the surfaces that I need. So I'm just going to run the curve boolean. I want to pick that curve. And I don't even know what the makeup of this geometry is. That's why I run curve boolean because I don't feel like managing all that stuff. So delete input, I'm going to say use. Combine regions, no. I want three separate regions. And then I just say one, two, three. And now I've got three closed curves on there. That is the bad surface that I get rid of. I take these curves here. make them planar surfaces and I can put them on my Y model or in this case my Z model and hide the curves for a second Go back up top, see if there, I think there was another little bad one in there, but I'll, I'll check it out and see what the deal's with it. Yeah, this thing, I don't even know what this thing is all about. It's pretty ugly. It looks like it's the top of something. So in a case like this, this is some ugly jump. 
right? I'm just going to delete it. If I need it in the drawing, I can put it in there in Illustrator. But it's not worth my time to rebuild that geometry and then punch it back in there when I'm not even sure if it's actually going to show up. It could be a surface-on-surface -surface connection. So, later. My, I've got, if I look at my wireframe, I've got some kind of residual stuff going on with my, it's just in the top view and sometimes in the perspective view because of it. But it's just a kind of graphics card giving me some noise. It's nothing that's going to affect a make 2D or anything like that. This is a surface that belongs over with its friend. And that's just me having to move it correctly. There we go. Cool. So this is definitely not enough spacing when I do this. I want to give it a little bit more. And I can always about learn, but I want a little bit of breathing room between my three objects. So that that probably actually is still probably not enough. These 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 tall slender ones take up a lot of real estate. So now I could just start testing it by doing it. Um, you, so like I said before, we're gonna the kind of manual way to do it is. For an axonometric projection, you have to know what angle that you want to tilt it. So like we said, we're tilting to the left 60 degrees. So the first thing I do is I take the geometry and I rotate it. I want to rotate it by the front, the pivot point. You want a nice kind of pivot point. So I'll just use the transform and I can rotate it. I could also just move the gumball to this point. Um, that's the point, I'm going to go over to this side, and this is the direction I'm going. And this is where I type in 60 degrees, move it over a little bit. And then on the right hand side, I'm going to shear it back, backwards away from the front view. So I use the shear command, and I'm not making a copy. My origin point is the bottom, my reference point is the top. And I'm going backwards, so I'm going to go negative 45 to the right. And I left one guy behind when I did it. Oh no, that's right. I undid my shear. There we go. So, this is a good setup. I can I can skew it from here, but this is a this is a good this is a good spot to be. You can see in my wireframe view, I've got the kind of geometry that's going to show up on a on a Make 2D. One thing I want to um, point out is, we, I'll give you a, a, the, the shortcut to that. For those that are having trouble in Rhino is we, we made just a shortcut button for it, which basically does everything that we just did. And that's just a really quick macro. So if you've never used a macro, you can enter them in Rhino. And then basically what you're doing is instead of running all those commands, you can type those commands in to be automated. It's, it's kind of like the, the most basic kind of dumb way to script because you're literally replacing typed commands by typing the commands first and then just punching them through there, right? So you can see on this, on this button here, um, first thing we do is we select the model. If nothing's selected, that pause asks us to pick something. And then we pick something, the pause goes off. It makes the viewport the top. It rotates it 60 degrees. Then it sets the viewport to the right. Then it shears it. When you run the shear, it asks you what's the origin point. That's where it says 0, 0, 0, negative 45. Changes the viewport to the top again, and then zooms it to the extent. So it does all those things automatically for you. And the only difference on the left-hand click is the left-hand click exports it into a separate model.
for safekeeping so you can keep working on their project if you wanted to. So instead of doing all those steps and kind of running the kind of risk of clicking to the wrong thing, especially if you haven't done it before, then I just click the button instead. And I get the same and I get the same thing that I just did. And if also known as the AXO button. Mm-hmm. Famously known as the AXO button that won the West. So if I want to change it, all you guys have to do, make any changes to this button if you ever need to use it in the future, is you hold down shift over it and you right click to edit it and you just change the numbers. So if I want to rotate the other way, I make it Let's say I want to do the AXO, but I want to do it 45 now, but I want to do it over to the right. So I would change it to negative 45 instead of positive 60. And hopefully it's saved the changes to my button. Yep, it did. So then when I run the button now, it's a 45 over to that side. But I'll change it back. Is that going to be embedded into the file? Or the down it's a separate download good question I was supposed to add that as part of the tutorial so that's a good one so I have it obviously if I don't have it I'll close it out I'll go to my toolbars and act like it's not there close it out so when when you go to download off the video the templates and stuff it'll just be zipped up with a toolbar file you want to put the toolbar file anywhere safe um, you can go bury it in your Rhino program files or you can just keep it somewhere safe that you're not going to move around but in order to add it I'm going to go to tools and go to toolbar layout This is your toolbar layout manager. Basically, the, these are files which are containers for toolbars. Default has a ton. Uh, this ViewMaker one has one. Ours only has one. I'm going to go to File, um, Open. I'm going to go to wherever I put it. Um, here it is. You'll have it downloaded. It'll be called Axonometric View. And it's a toolbar file. It has a RUI extension on it and it just pops up. Now nothing's going to happen until you click on the little checkbox here. That's the actual toolbar and that's, that'll make it pop up. If you don't check it you'll just be wondering where it's at and it could show up anywhere random on your screen so don't expect it to show up in any particular place and then say okay and then you'll have it. Now if you use stuff a lot you can you know, or you like this one you can always take the toolbar and just dock it up here and it'll be hanging out every time you open up Rhino until you move, if you move the file, it won't open it up anymore. It won't know where to find it. Any questions on that? You guys, some of you guys, most of you guys have done the toolbar stuff before, right? In some capacity, but if you're not sure, just check. So let me go and go back to what we're doing. So I've hit my magic button. I've got my projection the way that I need it. I'm, act, I'm ready to do the make 2D um, at that point now that it's cleaned up. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to run my make 2D command. Current view for sure. Um, we're going to do tangent edges, hidden lines, source layers, all that stuff's good. I'm not going to change any of these options. You want to make sure you've, um, oh, one thing I didn't make sure is I turn off the transversal surfaces the first time. I'm going to turn them off. I'm going to do them as a separate drawing. Um, hit OK. And they drop down there. So the next thing that I want to do is, before I do anything else, I turn the transversal surfaces on. I turn my model off. And I do a little bit of work on this. I want these things to line up later on when I do the Make 2D. So a quick way to do that is to save my view right now. That way I can zoom in and work on these curves for a second 
and not worry about lining them up later on. I could definitely easily manually line them up, but I'm just going to, I've got these already saved up for my sections. I'm just going to name this one for make 2D, something like that. That's saved, and now I can kind of go in. Before I do anything, what I want to do is I want to close these curves up, right? So I'm going to pick them. I'm not worried about these curves here. We're not going to use the ones that are just hanging out at the very bottom of the face because you can't really see them anyway. We're going to worry about the two sections that we can see into. I'm going to use the curve boolean tool again. Um, well, for these guys, I can just use the join command. They're just right now, their um, their closed kind of surfaces going on. Actually, before I do that, I've got to do the make 2D version of them. So let me restore my view and run that. and actually do it on the curves themselves. Use the same options. That drops them off down there. Because I use different objects, it dropped them off down there. So I'm just gonna go to my layers. Oh no, that's bad news. didn't make new layers for my make 2D stuff. Let's see what happened on the options there. Weird. Where are my missing layers there? Bizarre. That's a new one to me. something here. Nope. It's telling me it's going to make my layers and it's not making my new layers. Wow. Okay. Some kind of bugs going on here. I want to... It's probably a restart. Yeah. Looks like a restart situation. So let me just save it real quick. Restart it. That one's new. I've never had to just not make new layers. That's really bizarre. Close out my other copy of Rhino. Just fired it back up. Has anybody ever seen that one before? Just I know we did make 2D a lot before. No one ran into that one. Cameras on me. That's why, right? So. Yeah, I've never. I'm, weird but okay let's see give it another shot so I've, I'm gonna turn off my I've got my transversal surfaces my models here 
just just to make sure I'm going to change it to the layers that I've always run them on so change object layer these are the old layers from the old model I don't know why that would make a difference but take off my surfaces run it again maybe it was something to do with the imported there it is maybe it's something to do with the imported geometry I honestly don't know that's a really weird bug I've so I've got them there um, and then I'm going to turn on the transversal surfaces turn the Z's on just make it easy on myself and do a select objects on that layer deselect these guys rerun the make 2d I want to do them separately so that it always makes my um, it, it counts my and that way they're in the right spot that they're that counts them as not hidden I don't want them to count as hidden I want them to all be deemed kind of visible so when it comes to the actual kind of construction of this drawing, um, because we didn't use the clipping planes, we don't have that separate clipping planes layer that, that hangs out and we can just kind of clean up. So I'm just going to do a little bit of uh, doctoring on here. So I'm just going to add a new layer called section cuts and make it something visible like red. That's going to be in my make 2D layer. It's going to sit up at the top of it. Um, I'm going to turn off my hidden stuff for now. I'm going to turn off anything that's like 3D that I don't need anymore because I'm just working on the make 2D stuff now. So I don't mess with any of that. And I'm just looking at this stuff. I can take off hidden um, and I can take off the visible for a second, but I got to take it off for the model. Just to talk about these guys, I'm going to lose the little one sitting at the bottom of my door or my face, don't need that. Um, the curb boolean stuff doesn't necessary here because I don't have um, multiple regions, but it would work the same way. I would want to use the curve boolean tool to kind of join all this thing up and, and clean it up first and make closed ones there. So um, for some reason, if I had um, some extra kind of curves, or you're, you're, this is more likely the case when you actually have some geometry, you're going to start having all this kind of stuff than you would use the curve boolean tool for that and you just want to delete input everything that's used and you want to combine regions in this case and pick that and pick them all and combine them it's going to give you closed curves and you can delete any of that other stuff you can do delete all too that works too these just need to join they're going to be separate curves looks like though I've got five so if I do select dupe I don't have duplicates so it just means I got like a little segment in there so I'm gonna try and join them and that's good I've got two closed curves so I've only got three closed curves that I need to worry about those are good um, turn those off look at my sections that are cutting here so I've got some kinda geometry going on here what I want again is closed curves for my section that's getting kind of sliced through here so the kind of method is just to trace out what gets cut on the section itself I'm right in front of a face it looks like I wasn't careful and I nudged it this is the face I was worried about getting behind I'm actually supposed to be on the face I'm supposed to be a little bit behind this one this kind of section shouldn't be coming through there so this should be visible through there so do as I say and not as I do on that one the face should go back a little bit more on the section cut so this little mass here isn't blocking off and um, because of that the the section is a little bit hard to read so I'll demo it on this one back here on how to make the section cuts which is basically just a matter of quickly tracing out your, you can kind of quickly trace out the geometry that it is by doing a bunch of polylines real quick. You're, the, when you've got these kinds of sections within sections, um, it all depends on what kind of geometry you're dealing with and how your model's put together. But I'll show you the case that happens sometimes is you don't want to keep looping and do a, curve in, a closed curve inside of a curve. 
Like you don't want to run it up here and do a closed curve inside of our curve. Because then you and when you go to Illustrator, you, you won't know what to do with it. So you can just do one closed curve. Looks like that one's a little off, so I'll redo it. You do one closed curve. And then you just butt it up against another one. White dots, it's um, just it's a test command called test toggle round points that you run that changes them from squares to circles. Whoever asked that. So we got to close one there. And the other one can just run up the side of it. So I run the command again. Now, this is one thing, you know, the way this is this, my graphics card, it's not playing nice. It's not putting the red thing up front. But I can select something and have an active selection and make a new geometry. So now I'm using that to my advantage. I'm picking the thing I need to reference, and I'm just keeping it as active for when I draw the new geometry that I want to do. Otherwise, I'd have to grab it. I'd have to bring it to the front. I'd have to do a bunch of other things just to get that thing to play nice. And I don't exactly feel like doing that. So I'm going to close this up. And I've got two closed curves there. And I can add that to my selection. So I'm slicing through here. I'm also going to slice through this top part here. And if I don't get it right, I can just turn on my control points and snap it to where it needs to snap to get it right. When I'm, I can always hit C to close it up when I'm ready for my last point. So this one. That'll be good enough to get the point across. I got one more down here as well. But that'll give us our section cut. So this is on its its own distinct layer. The control point um, editing is on for this one, so I hit escape on that. That gets tucked back away. That's the one layer I need. The visibles are OK. My section cuts are a separate layer, and my transversal ones are ready so basically all I do is add whatever kind of section cuts that I've got you can also go and just go joining you can grab curves and if you've got the right connections and all that other kind of stuff you can do stuff like that too you can also use the curve boolean to do it it's all means to an end it doesn't matter what you just to make your life easier is you want those kind of closed curves for your your sections there so um, those are good and I'm just gonna exit them out so I'm gonna export them turn on all my stuff run an export we're gonna export it as an illustrator file and we don't have to worry this is a one-to-one -one drawing so um, I don't have to worry about changing the scale to it. I can. I want to leave my scale to be one to one. I'm going to have my color be CMYK. Let's say okay. Now the kind of back into the template here. We've got right now is a placeholder for what we call the z-axis right there. So I'm basically just going to take those objects and get rid of them. One thing I didn't talk about is when I'm doing the make 2D stuff here. If I'm not happy with the spacing, um, and that one doesn't look too bad, but if not, like we said last class, it's a little bit easier to move them in Rhino than it is to move it in Illustrator. It's a little more wonky because in Rhino, I can just start to shift them around. So if I want to move my face up and closer, I can draw the direction by picking that point, picking another point, 
and then not clicking on it but hitting the tab button and that creates a directional constraint and then I can pick at what point I want my face to come out and, I'm, and it's easier quicker for me to do that than it is to try to do something that exact in Illustrator so on back in the back in back into the Illustrator I'm going to open up my file here and you can do these all at the same time right you, I'm doing I'm not doing them all at the same time but you definitely could do them all bring them um, paste them into one Rhino file and then just do one export and move your stuff around that way the layers are gonna stay intact and all that good stuff too so no problem on that I'm gonna go to my uh, demo drawing zoom out for a second so we've got the drawing here I'm just gonna make it it's big right it's one-to-one -one. so I'm just gonna make it some random size to, to accommodate it and do my do my line weights in here which are gonna be kinda of the same um, for all the drawings really kinda of basic stuff so when we go to our layers we've got our section cuts I'm gonna grab those you, I mean, there's going to be more in a finished case, but these are the ones that are going to apply, and those are just going to be black. So I'm going to bring up my open swatch library to default swatches, and I'm going to start with print, right? And under my swatches, I'm going to do it, and I'll see if I remember the numbers that were true black. Does anybody remember the numbers? 60, right? 30, 20. I'm the worst. Lovely. That's going to be my fill, one point. Um, oh, that's my stroke, and it's also going to be the fill. Simple enough. That's also going to be for our um, my layers when I go to our visible lines. Are you kidding me? We're missing our hidden lines. Yeah, I had them turned off. I'm the worst on that one. Well, not to make you sit through that process again. It'll be the, the, the on the example, you'll be able to see them. I'll show them right here. Um, my transversal is more important. That one's going to be a black stroke on the outside as well. So I've got black on the outside. If I go to um, the print, we've got this lovely lime green color here, which is 50, 0, 100. And that's going to be the fill on there, actually. Right there. And our stroke's going to be black. So we can leave that at one. The layers on it are going to be visible up top we want the um, transversal at the very top of everything and we want it to be have uh, a multiplier on it so I put it inside there I don't want it inside of it I want it right there so select that layer and I'm going to go to appearance and I'm going to change the opacity to a multiply opacity that happens to it so we can see through that one as well so what's missing is the hidden lines if you look at if you look at my uh is that that's a that wrong color huh so i'd switch back on my uh my swatches there so let me get the right color Print.
I could have sworn it was that one. Yeah, that's the one we're supposed to have. Um, that's weird. That's 20, 110. So we're going on this one. We've got to reach a consensus. <laughs> okay, so what I was getting at, the missing, the hidden lines, we're going to have those turned on. Those are black, true black. The stroke on that is 0.25. Where do the hidden lines go in the layer order? The bottom. Please don't put them at the top. Even though they're 0.25, you'll definitely make it a little hairy on it because they'll start to, they'll start to just do weird stuff. So keep it that way. Um, in order to get it in there, you're, these kind of slots, I don't know what else to call them, right? It's kind of like a track. They're already there. So I'm just going to copy it and I'm going to paste it in there. And I'm going to go to my layers and check out the new layers, which are these three, and put them under model drawings. That's my <clears throat> old ones. They should be. So let me do it. I'll just put them in there together under my z-axis drawings. Weird. So now I can grab them all at one time and get them situated. And I can still adjust them and fudge with them as I need to. Usually when I do stuff like this, I turn on um, the, the outline mode by hitting like control Y or option Y if you've got a Mac and that way I can just actually go into outline mode and, and grab stuff and, and adjust it with a little bit more precision than Illustrator typically has. And I can just start to grab the actual thing and start to use the smart tracking a little bit better on it and then I can just toggle it back off with control Y. So given that and the kind of beauty of the hidden lines that we can picture in there is going to get us um, where we need to go. That's where, you know, that's a nice illustration there is the, the, the matter of material thickness that shows up when you don't have the hidden lines versus when you do have the hidden lines. So it's a nice advantage that having the hidden lines gives us. So again, try to clean up your geometry um, as much as possible. It's going to draw a line in Rhino any time that you have a face, you're going to have a new one. So when you're, when you're doing stuff and you're making all these kinds of different adjustments and everything else, be sure to do your merge faces before you start doing all the Make 2D stuff because it'll just save you a lot of cleaning up. I did, make, I did merge faces on all these different shapes and that way I didn't have to go in and delete all these extra lines. If I have multiple faces on something like this, that's more lines I've got to delete and figure out. If you clean up your model, I can't stress it enough, you clean it up 100%, you won't have to do any of the line editing and all your editing can be through layers instead. That's the 
you, you want to front load your efforts in that respect, right? Um, any questions? Yeah. Uh, for the transpersonal spaces, mm -hmm. if they're not on the ground plane or whatever we're calling it, um, are, like, would it still show in lines or, or how would it work? Is all of these? My well, I, I did a quick one without much thinking on it, but I actually have one here that's it's a big one that has a bottom and then this ramp that goes up. Oh, that ramp. Yeah, yeah. And in reality, what 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 I would recommend doing is if it was I would do some editing and make it clear and show it as the ramp going up. I did it was just a really quick demo thing, but if those backs are going to walls and they're kind of dead ends. So in reality, it would just be this one going up this ramp and out on a higher level out the back. That's a that's a good question. On uh, you know you kind of want to it's any kind of editing that happens in a drawing, right? So in this case, actually, these are all union together. I, th I think these are union together. I'm not exactly sure. No, they're not union together. Like that. Yeah. We'll let it in union those together. I guess another question yeah. after that, um, like if if it like on that end one, where yeah. there is a transversal still, like it it shows that part where it goes out also. Like, would you would you always include that, or would you just include like the tunnel part? Mm. Like, do you include the whole plane, or just the actual path? On like on here? Not on that one. On This one. No, one more actually. This that, one. That one, yeah. You know what I mean? Like yeah. The parts that kick out? I, on this one, I would because because oh, the taper happens like right here. Yeah. So what I would do is I'd leave it like that and I'd come in and I'd. Eh, it depend. It, yeah, it depends. Like, because it technically it's a, all right. That is kind of also a design consideration. Because some people have these kind of serpentine things that happen, and they actually want things to open up a lot, right? Uh, versus this one where you could technically walk all the way back here and then come back out and then go back up. I don't know if you have any additional input on that, but I, I think that is a, it, it, it's a kind of the editing of the, di in an almost a diagrammatic method of like telling people what you want them to know and explaining the space in a matter that is, that is a little more edited. I, I no, would it's, think it's definitely a design consideration because you now that it's one volume in a way, every surface would flood into everything else. Yeah, it's it's so, so continuous, yeah. Highlighting the transversal surface is, is for you to kind of script that this is the intention of how you traverse this volume. I think there's gonna be actually like coloring on the same surface. Yeah, I think some lines of demarcation might be necessary for you guys to yeah. say, well, this, yeah. and especially when when you're dealing with the the three different ones, it, it might it might kind of help mm -hmm. out. So, yeah, that's a good point. I'm definitely don't put the thought into it uh, at at that level. I was kind of more just approaching it from the technical, but that's where it would go. I would say, like you might that might be a decision that actually happens back in Rhino. Like you you just trim it up and you make it as like a what you want it to be, and you don't avoid the work of doing it in kind of Illustrator. Um, but you might not be sure either. So one, one thing is you could, like I did on that other one, is have it just in pieces still. And, and, and as a drawing, actually edit it as you get to see it all together with the correct line weights and everything like that. This section is a live um, a document. There's a lot of things going on in this section that you have to visualize. The section is basically the proof that the building functions. All things are connected. So I think the benefit of seeing the, the, the sections of it is not just to show it, but to you to remember that these lines are connected. You imagine all of this, uh, some of this are connected, some of them are not. There's some kind of space in between. So maybe one black caching there, but in your own way, remember they're, they're connecting. 
Typically the most busy drawing you're going to have is a section. It doesn't help when it's an axonometric, so it's a, it's a little bit more familiar, disfamiliar territory, so there's definitely a lot of kind of ending. But it can be extremely powerful. It might be one of the only methods from, from drawing perspective that we can actually get into something so complicated as this. Even on its own, it would be complicated without the section, so we kind of really need it. But any, any more questions? Is there a paper size, or is it just whatever fits your drawing? Oh, the template's already just at a size already. It's a big one. It's like uh, 34 57. by 57. <laughs> yeah, because it's one-to-one, -one and we're spreading it out. So I would say for our pinups, you know, we would probably print it at a smaller size and save save it for the final to do the really big one. Yeah. So the the one to one actually means if you took your physical model you put it on there the base would actually match. You could line these up right on these tracks right here, yeah. Right. For sure. But it kind of needs it. Yeah. This stuff you can see how busy my one in the middle gets already, just in terms of that. But yeah. So and then should there be an order to which sequence you put them in? Should it be four, five, three, or the tracks are going to do that for you because of the width of the tracks. So yeah, I would just leave it at right, at right here. It's um, it's in descending order in terms of the width of it. Yeah. So which tends to make sense because the one in the middle has the most, so it kind of requires the most breathing space to kind of get that thing spread out. So. Yeah, I would just leave it like this one, and I'll, I'll include a PNG of this guy just as a, as a kind of reference in the, in the zip. So the zip will have the three Rhino templates, you know, for one for each projection, and then uh, the Illustrator template, the toolbar file, um, Don's phone number, like everything we can possibly throw into that zip file, we're just going to put in there. So. Anything else we think of in the meantime? Yeah. Any any more questions? Good questions. Cool. Yeah. All right. Thanks, guys.